evening. Good evening. Welcome to our Monday Thursday service this year. Tonight and tomorrow night are going to be nights where we leave church in silence because we have, will have then entered into our Lord's Passion. And so I'll make the announcements beforehand. So please be aware, of course, that we will have our Good Friday service tomorrow at 7, and then also we will have our Easter Day festival service at the normal service time at 10.30. We'll also be having the showing of the Passion of the Christ Saturday night at 7 o'clock, so if you'd like to come and join us for that, please do so. For the order of service tonight, we're going to be following right one, which you have either in the bulletin or on page 41 in the front of the hymnals, and we'll begin with the opening prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen.
Let us confess our sins unto God and pray. We poor sinners confess to you, O God, not only that we have often and in many ways offended you, our Lord and Maker, in thought, word, and deed, so that you could with perfect justice reject and condemn us for all eternity. Therefore we come before you with sorrow of heart, in dread and terror of your holy justice and of everlasting death. Our sins are a grievous foe, which we should hate in every way as long as we live. O merciful God, you still grant us in this hour to be reminded of your fatherly goodness. According to the promise of your word, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and implore you, dearest Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised again for our justification. Forgive us all our sins through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts to full assurance. We therefore pray you, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins. We poor sinners are willing to forgive all who have offended against us. We earnestly desire to grow into godliness. Help us, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
that of your great mercy you have given us your sacrament in which we eat your body and drink your blood. Grant us, we pray you, that we may not receive this gift unworthily, but that we may confess our sins, remember your passion, believe your forgiveness, and day by day grow in faith and love until we obtain eternal salvation. Through you, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Oh, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for tonight is what St. John writes in the 13th chapter of his Gospel, verses 1 through 17. And please rise as we hear these words in Jesus' name. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments, and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And we pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In the sermon tonight, we're going to look at the other side of Monday Thursday. Nearly every year on this day, we have focused on the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is an appropriate thing to do. Tonight, we will share in that supper. We will receive the same meal of Christ's holy body and precious love, blood that he gave to his disciples at the Last Supper. The only difference between our reception tonight and theirs then is that you will not see and hear Jesus. The only one you will see and hear is me, your pastor. But even though he is not present with us, visibly and audibly, Jesus is always the host at this meal, because this meal is himself, his own true body and blood, which he gives to us for our forgiveness and salvation. But tonight, our focus is on what Jesus did for his disciples before that, when he stood up from the table, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. At some churches, this is the focus of Monday Thursday every year. The pastor will even wrap a towel around his waist and copy Jesus by washing the feet of the people of his congregation. So many churches do this because of the command that Jesus gave his disciples in verse 15. You also should do just as I have done to you. Now, of course, there isn't anything inherently wrong with copying what Jesus did in these verses. But we also shouldn't think that the point of what Jesus did was simply that Christians should have clean feet. The deeper meaning of these events, the true meaning, is one of humility and love. We know this is about love because John says so. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus, washing his disciples' feet, was part of his loving them to the end. Everything Jesus did from that moment on, he did because he loved them. But the foot washing in particular was about humility. The custom in that time and place was that the feet of dinner guests would be washed by a servant before they ate. 
in our time and place, where we wear nice, breathable shoes and drive essentially everywhere, this might not be such a bad job to have. But back in those days, washing people's feet would honestly have been pretty disgusting. Think about it. In the hot, dry climate of Judea, where people walked around all day in leather sandals, imagine the bouquet of smells you would encounter. It would be just as unpleasant for the ones whose job it was to wash feet as it was pleasant for those whose feet was being washed. This is what Jesus was showing his disciples when he washed their feet. He was showing them that there was no job which he thought was too low for him to do. He was showing them that he was willing to take the position of the lowest servant just to make them feel safe and happy. This is why it doesn't really make sense for us to copy what Jesus did today. The true, deeper meaning of his actions just does not apply to our culture and to our feet. In fact, the meaning of his actions wasn't even clear to his disciples. That was why he asked them if they understood what he had just done for them. He did not want them to think that the biggest lesson they should learn from this was that their feet didn't stink anymore. He explained you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Back in those days, the most important person for a student was his teacher. The students would follow their teacher and listen to him and try to be just like him. So in that way, already, Jesus was far superior to all his disciples. But the title of Lord was even stronger. Politically, this title meant someone who ruled over others and had a right to be served by them. But theologically, the title of Lord meant that he was his disciples' God. So if Jesus, their teacher and God, didn't think that he was above performing the most demeaning job of a servant, then who would they be to think that they weren't above this job either? And if the disciples were not above the lowest jobs, then of course, neither are we. When Jesus told his disciples, and by connection tells all of us, to wash each other's feet, he is not only literally telling us to go get towels and buckets of water and start washing. Jesus means that all who consider him to be their teacher and Lord should be humble like he was. No Christian should ever think that they are too high and mighty to do something that will help their neighbor. If only we were as humble as Jesus. If only we had his perfectly loving, selfless attitude, and we always put the needs and feelings of others before our own. But this does not describe how we have acted and how we have thought about ourselves. Instead of placing ourselves underneath our Lord and Savior, so often we have allowed our sinful natures to place ourselves way above him, into the delusion that we are too good for some jobs and even too good for some people. Whenever we think and act this way, whenever we refuse to humble ourselves in love for the sake of others, we are rejecting the example of Jesus. We are rejecting Jesus himself. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus Christ, the great and final prophet of God, was not above washing the stinky, dirty feet of his disciples. Jesus Christ, the eternally begotten Son of God, was not above doing the work of the lowest servant. Jesus then said, If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do that. It's not enough for us to simply nod and smile and pay lip service to the love and humility Jesus showed when he washed his disciples' feet. The blessedness of which Jesus spoke comes to us when we actually do it, when we in faith show love and humility just like Jesus did. The ability to do this is not something that we naturally have inside us. From birth, the only natural inclination we have is to think of ourselves and to present ourselves just about as highly as we can. It's a good thing, then, that we'll be receiving this love and humility tonight. 
along with the true body and blood of Christ, which we are given to eat along with the bread and wine, we are given what Jesus used his body and blood to accomplish, the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal salvation. And along with these blessings, we are also given Jesus' humility and love. We are sacramentally given the ability to ignore our own sinful pride and to give our full attention to what Jesus tells us in his gospel. We don't have to put on a show for God and all mankind of how great and powerful we are, as if puffing out our feathers like that will somehow make God more inclined to forgive us and bless us. The way to God's love and forgiveness, and ultimately the way to be with him in heaven is the way of humility. Not our humility, but that of Jesus. When Peter initially refused to let Jesus wash his feet, Jesus said to him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. In other words, if you haven't been saved by the love and humility of your Savior, then you are saved. If the cross of Christ is not where you believe your sins have been paid for in full, then that payment doesn't count for you. In reply to what Jesus said, Peter then blurted out, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Peter wanted salvation his way. If Jesus said that to have a share with him, you had to be washed by him, then of course Peter would think that if a little washing was good, then a lot would be better. But that is not the kind of washing Jesus was talking about. It's not the amount of water that Jesus uses to clean you that's important. It is the power of the gospel that he uses to clean you that matters. This is why just a few splashes of water in baptism is able to give us faith and wash away our sins. This is why just a little bite of bread and a sip of wine is able to give us all the blessing Jesus used his body and blood to earn. It isn't the amount of the earthly element that matters for our forgiveness and salvation. It is the power of Jesus' gospel that matters. Baptism is a full and complete washing because Jesus says it is. And the Lord's Supper is the most spiritually filling meal possible because we are receiving Jesus' true body and blood. So we don't demand with Peter that Jesus save us how we think is best. Instead, we ask Jesus to save us however he wants to. And we believe him when he shows us this salvation in the gospel. After he washed his disciples' feet, Jesus lowered himself even further, all the way to the depths of hell, when he suffered and died for our sins on the cross. We see from what Jesus did on Monday, Thursday, and then endured on Good Friday, what we should believe, and also how we should live. Jesus holds out to us this lesson of love and humility, and he asks us that we follow him. There is nothing that his word and the law of love will ever ask us to do for which we are too high and mighty. Just as we trust Jesus to save us from sin and death, so also we strive to reflect the love and humility that he has shown to us and to all mankind. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Father in heaven, you have granted us the body and blood of the Lamb of God to be the seal of our covenant relationship with you and the blessed food of eternal life. Grant us faithful hearts so that what we receive with our lips we may keep in our hearts, and what we keep in our hearts may manifest itself in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of mercy, 
Give us zeal for you, for your house, and for the things of your kingdom, that we may be faithful in response to your mercy. Raise up good and faithful pastors who will preach and teach your word, rightly dividing law and gospel. Open the ears of all who hear your word, that they may respond with faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of hope, as your Son entered the holy place, and secured for us our eternal salvation. Give us confidence that we may not fear our enemies, but joyfully trust in your power and strength. Give to the sick and those in pain the fullness of your gracious presence, and deliver them according to your will, especially Sandy, David, Charlie, and all whom we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father of peace, give peace to our troubled world. Give us good and honest leaders who will govern according to your commands. And give us patience that we may not be disheartened with the struggles of this mortal life, but endure in faith and hope through the merits and mercies of Jesus Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of grace, you give us what we do not deserve and daily your mercies are new. Open our eyes so that we may learn gratitude and return to you the tithes and offerings of a thankful heart with the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving we bring to you in worship and song. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of joy, in the midst of our sorrows, comfort us so that we may not be overcome by grief and keep us from becoming bitter for the jealousy of our selfish hearts. Guide us to know and rejoice in the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of glory, those who have gone before us with a sign of faith already rest in your arms. Grant us grace to sustain us through each day so that we may be kept holy and blameless by your grace and come to the marriage supper of the Lamb in your kingdom, which knows no end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Give thanks to you, Holy Lord, 
Almighty Father, everlasting God, on the tree of the cross, you gave salvation to all mankind, that whence death arose by the fault of one man, thence also might life arise by the obedience of one man, and that even as Satan was overcome by a tree, likewise by a tree he was overcome through the death of Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy,
This is the true body of Christ given to you. This is the true blood of Christ shed for you. Depart in peace.
We now continue with the hymn of thanksgiving, and please rise.
for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Me. A company of evildoers encircles me. 
They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count 